Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. You talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And you know, there's a tendency among some music historians and critics to say that after certain moments, nothing would ever be the same. In the 1990s, many would agree there were two concrete moments where this would become the closest to being actually true. The first was in 1991 with the release of Nevermind by Nirvana, an album that would redefine mainstream rock music in a fundamental way, at least for a time. The second Second, it seemed a bit more gradual, but the ripple effects would shake the foundations of a very different genre, the twin deaths of two of the greatest hip-hop legends of that era, the second golden age of hip-hop, Tupac Shakur in September of 1996, and the notorious B.I.G. in March of 1997. They were moments that shook gangster rap to its core, and in the mainstream would prompt a hard shift towards brighter, glitzier subject matter on both coasts. But true historians of that era would tell you, it's never that simple. You could easily make the argument that Puff Daddy was laying the foundation in the last months of 1996 with a mace for a more polished and opulent sound coming out of New York, coupled with the signing of the Telecommunications Act in 1996 that would enable radio companies to buy up local stations and deliver nationally syndicated programs, which bucked against the regionality and even some of the feuds of that time. And let's not ignore the pushback building against the monopolistic presence that gangster rap in the mid-90s had on the radio, which marginalized pop rap and the more conscious artists who had seen their momentum short-circuited after 93-94. There just wasn't space for them. But in 1997, with pop rap quickly gaining ascendancy and even some of the softer conscious material, there was no incentive for national radio conglomerates to play the conscious, forward-thinking, or more outright weird hip-hop that was starting to bubble up again, especially given that its instrumental palette seemed stuck in the past, at least on a surface listen. And then the rap industry began enforcing a divide where major label success and the hits and the sales were deemed worthy of critical acclaim, where the smaller underground shops, they were disdained for not having the same maximalist appeal or sound or budget. And while there would be outliers like DMX and Eminem to keep the anger alive, to some extent, they served a different audience and a different purpose. And even at the time, a lot of rap publications like The Source would not always give them their due. Hell, Eminem rapped about it. But we're not even talking about then. No, for this year, we're staying strictly underground. Only independent hip-hop for 2019 in this series. Many albums of which would garner critical acclaim for those people in the know, but rarely accumulate the same praise or commercial success as even a few of them could have seen but a few years earlier. Marginalized as backpackers, weirdos, hipsters, and freaks, they would nevertheless keep the flame of lyrical and experimental hip-hop burning against an industry that would ignore them at best and spurn them at worst, and yet, you can make the serious argument that their influence lingers far more powerfully to this day, even in the mainstream. And really, there's only one place where we can start this conversation. That's right, folks. For 2019, we're talking late 90s, early to mid-2000s underground hip-hop. And we gotta start with Fun Crusher Plus by Company Flow. And this is is Resonators. So, in comparison with the year I spent on hardcore punk on Resonators back in 2018, 2019 is going to be a little bit different, if only because my exposure to the genre is very different. With hardcore punk, I didn't really have the same depth and knowledge of not only the classic albums, but the larger discographies of the artists behind all of them. With the underground hip-hop in the late 90s and early 2000s, not only am I more familiar with it, I've reviewed albums from some of these acts before. I I've seen how they've aged and grown. And in this case specifically, we're dealing with one of the first acts in which rapper producer LP was ever associated. And while his voice was immediately distinctive on this album, I knew who he was, he changed both in his production and rapping style in the past 20 years. And that's important to acknowledge and place in context, especially as LP's brand of production has become so widely adopted and influential, borderline ubiquitous in parts of the underground, which for me places this project in another context because not only am I familiar with LP's work nowadays with Run the Jewels or Solo, but I'm also familiar with the underground producers who built so much of their templates and their sonic palette on him. And this is also where the conversation gets a little bit complicated because
this thanks to the hard division that became entrenched between mainstream and underground hip-hop, you can't exactly avoid a certain reactionary tinge in the underground, especially compared to the expensive, flashy, moneyed veneer that Puff was pushing in New York City in 1997. And all this matters because it was indicative of the approach across the board in the composition of an album like this. Because not only did Company Flow have the freedom to be anti-commercial and not care about a larger audience and sales, they relished it. And thus the line between a lack of polish as a debut project and moves taken deliberately to alienate a mainstream audience, that gets kind of blurry. Of course, Company Were Flow were signed to Ruckus Records, and people tend to forget that along with the co-CEOs Brian Brader and Jarrett Meyer, there was James Murdoch, son of Rupert Murdoch of Fox News, and ample evidence that this album might not be allowed to get that revolutionary, but that's just conspiracy on my part, and really I don't hold that against a 22 year old LP or his fellow group members rapper Big Just and DJ Mr. Len. But that's a big observation with Fun Crusher Plus if you're coming to it just familiar with the magnetic tightness and catchiness that has run the jewels now. Namely, this album is not tight nor particularly catchy nor is it trying to be. You're mostly here for an overwritten bars fest against complicated, groundbreaking production for the time. And there are numerous lines on this album highlighting how this just might not be for you if you're not willing to accept the hard shifts in vocal fidelity or the oblique interludes, or in the case of 89.9 Detrimental, a shift to an early freestyle that leads right into the next track. And that's not even talking about the content. Hell, a song like Loon TNS is filled with references to the New York City graffiti song Scene, and if you don't catch a few clues to that, you're going to be hopelessly lost. And to this album's credit, for as much as so much of this bottom level dystopian rhetoric can feel paranoid and cluttered, a blend of sci-fi deep cuts, conspiratorial rambling, and nerd punk rage, it's hard to ignore how much LP and Big Just were just ahead of their time in setting that scene. The most striking example comes in the production and sample mixing alone with Help Wanted, with the extensive pull from the Alejandro Jodorowsky film The Holy mountain, but that same undercurrent of darkness and social commentary gives even some of the goofier bars some real punch, especially on songs like Tragedy and War in three parts. And that makes it clear that for as much as they want to showcase a real talent with a good spirit of competition, there is a bitterness and rage at a larger commercial system that would suppress the real creative lyricism and production in favor of just empty flash and shiny suits. They might not be trying to be commercial, but there used to be space on the radio for every everyone, even including them. Now granted, you can make the argument that given how often this album eventually circles back to some pretty explicit sexual references that would never get play for as juvenile and crass as they were, that some of the anger might be a little misplaced. I mean, they got their underground lane, why should they even care about the mainstream? But you know what, even then, the mainstream rap industry was assembling the mechanism to make Eminem one of the biggest stars in the world with a lot of similar content, and he had been on those raucous compiled violations as well. And more to the point, as LP highlights on Vital Nerve, not only does he disregard the diluting authority of said capitalist industry, and when the sales control the pecking order, he's got no faith in the majority. And I've always agreed with this, as popularity rarely, if ever, correlates with real quality. Might as well hammer that in right now. It's going to be a running theme of resonators this year. And you know what? If we're talking about overstuffed lyrical tightness and creativity, it's hard to ignore just how much wit is crammed into even single songs. And just when you think that it's all just wordplay and playful bars, LP drops the haunted and painfully graphic Last Good Kings, describing his mother's abuse at the hands of his stepfather and the mingled horror and guilt he felt in the aftermath that he couldn't do something to stop it. It's a moment of shocking rawness that he was very hesitant to include on this project, but in terms of humanizing the artist here, it's one of the most powerful moments, especially against the oily wiriness of the synth horns and the fragmented sample from Popeye of Till the Day I Die. And I'd be remiss to not mention more of the production here. The warping psychedelic keen off the guitars on Eight Steps Perfection, the scratching stuttering off the bass bass and slightly muffled guitar on Blind, the anime sample that opens up the bassy organs on Silence, the watery tinkle against the choppy scratches of Loon TNS, even if you can't follow that song, it sounds phenomenal, the wiry, jagged density of Tragedy of War in three parts, the alien futurism of the tones swirling around Info Kill 2, and the sheer heaviness of the scratches that can shake your speakers against the Middle Eastern guitar chords of The Fire in Which You Burn. Hell, even against the elegant keys in the bass where it sounds like Big Just 
is shouting through a lo-fi radio halfway across the room. It connects midway through the album, Crazy Kings. But now we gotta talk about the elephant in the room. A slice of unexpected but unsurprising ugliness that slides across the first half of this album that honestly I called out when I made resonators for hardcore punk last year. And I'm not about to ignore it here, namely that for as playful and immature as this project can be, there's a bad tendency to circle back to homophobic slurs and even lines on songs like Legends such as homosexual MCs receive five mics, referring back to the source. Delivered with the sort of disdain that is absolutely a bad look nowadays. Hell, even to the mainstream is probably even a bad look then or to certain subsets of the underground. Now. Let me provide some context here, like I did for Hardcore back in the 80s. Underground hip-hop in the late 90s was overwhelmingly male-dominated. In the sustained late 90s backlash to political correctness culture, sounds familiar? Gay slurs became prevalent again as an easy way to presumably take shots at mainstream culture that was only just beginning to accept them. And yet, while I do doubt there was genuine homophobia from the duo even then, it's the sort of cheap shots that not only have aged really really badly, it might explain why LP hasn't been in a hurry to reissue with this album this decade, but also reflect the sort of ignorance that's not even close to transgressive or really rebellious. Cheap attempts at macho posturing that's sadly way too common, even in nerdy spaces like this album is, that I might understand were a product of the time, but can make certain songs nowadays tough to stomach. I mean, I get why it's there, but doesn't mean I have to like it, doesn't mean it's aged all that well. But as a whole, Look, Fun Crusher Plus is not for everyone, and I'm not even certain that it entirely sticks the landing, especially given where LP would take his sound in later years. Dated questions aside, it's flabby and seems to treat actual hooks and song structures with disdain, relying on sheer bars and wordplay, absolute the sort of project made by a group of guys who've got no incentive to be commercial, the freedom to do so, and every incentive just to bar the mainstream to death and back if you're willing to give it the time. And if you are, it's absolute the sort of project Project that hits harder the further you get in. It definitely gets better the further you get in. And while I can just lift off the bars, folks, go here for yourself. I'm thinking a solid 8 out of 10. Absolutely recommended as a solid point for our exploration of late 90s underground hip hop. And it only gets harder from there, folks. Strap in. This is Resonators. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. I got another 11 episodes. I'm really happy to be taking on this particular genre subset this year. It's going to get a little fun. Um, friendly reminder, if you guys want to vote on upcoming episodes of Resonators, that's where you can check out my Patreon right now. And beyond that, what did you guys think about it? If you want to like, well, here's the thing. You can't actually buy or stream this album. It's not on iTunes. It's not on Spotify. I will have a link down to the full album that's on YouTube as we speak, so that's down in the description below. And for those of you who have heard it, hey, I've got the poll up there. I'm curious what you guys thought of it. I know a lot of you think it's an undiscovered classic, but I do think there are points that can be criticized, especially given where LP would take his sound going forward. It's a very promising starting point, but again, there are points that could have been better refined. That's all I'm saying. But hey, until then, I'm Mark, you're watching Resonators on Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.